Hello and welcome to the uh, BSI Organisational Resilience webinar on um, an introduction to the Annual Organisational Resilience Framework and Index for 2021. My name is Quentin Dunstan, I'm a Principal Consultant at BSI and I look after all things to do with organisational resilience across BSI. So in today's webinar, there are five key areas we're going to look at. So first of all, what is the organisational resilience framework? We're going to look at the actual report itself in the overview and some, some bits of detail. And then very importantly, how you can use the framework um, as a leader within your organisation to help steer and determine direction forwards through difficult periods. And then um, fourthly, key takeaways, just to summarise what we talk about and certainly any questions at the end. Uh, please just note your questions in the uh, questions box as we go through and uh, I'll answer those at the end. So the first thing to do is to look at what is the organisational resilience framework. So we've been running this index for uh, the four, last four years and out of that has come um, a framework that's based around four key categories, so leadership, people, process and product. And you'll see on the drawing, that, or on the chart there, that we, we shade these so we know which elements are included in them. And uh, we'll discuss those in more detail as we go through, uh, but you'll normally see two lines on, at least two lines on these charts, and it's the comparison between the lines that helps uh, give a view of where where you are. So the first thing to look at is, well, what actually does organisational resilience mean? So this comes from BS 65000, which is a guidance document on organisational resilience. We don't certify against it. Um, it will be, um, it's a bit like a balance sheet. If uh, it, you looked at organisational resilience at a specific date, literally within the next hour or so it could change just like a balance sheet so let's have a look at this and unpack what the definition talks about because i think this is a very useful definition so it's the ability of an organization to so the first line is all about the combination of those four categories we've talked about how do leadership people process and product interact to enable um an organization to adapt and change. So the ability is dependent on collaboration and consensus and being able to be flexible in those four areas. The second line is about anticipate, prepare for, respond and adapt to. So this is essentially a timeline. So if, if business didn't have a timeline, it would be very easy to, to, um, to run a business. So we would, wouldn't have deadlines, we wouldn't have tax returns by a certain date, we wouldn't have cash flow problems and so on. So the, the timeline is really important to understand when we're looking at how businesses respond to um, challenges. So the sort of challenges that they have to deal with are incremental change, so that could be slow and creeping, or sudden disruptions. We've all had experience of a sudden disruption over the last year. So finally in order to survive and prosper so the point of doing this the point of being resilient is so that the business has some longevity and it is able to grow through time and having turned businesses around in my in my earlier career one of the things that's really important is that you need growth to finance the business so um, the cash flow, as you'll see later on, is really important to businesses. And when you get a sudden disruption that interrupts cash flow dramatically, it makes it very difficult for the business to, to function unless it's got a strong balance sheet. And we'll see how people have responded in the financial aspects as we move forwards through this um, presentation. So, Really importantly, every organization has its own unique narrative. So everybody listening to this and every firm that you talk to will have its own story that supports why that, how that firm's got to where it is, what's maintaining it and what's making it go forwards. But it's the leadership team that has the responsibility for making decisions based on the identification and assessment of both internal and external risks so if you imagine 
the leadership team looking at how the business functions internally we need to understand that but also it's in the context of what um, or where the leadership team is trying to navigate the the business through um, so the challenges that it faces the BSI organizational framework is unique to BSI we've developed this and we've derived it from four key standards and these apply universally to all organizations no matter what their size so from a one-man band or one person band right the way through multinational uh, companies and even the way governments operate so these four standards that we've based these ideas on a BS 65,000 which I've already mentioned which gave us the definition of it we look at the code of practice for delivering effective governance of organizations so people are accountable and responsible for how they how they operate and supply chain risk management so looking at how that actually operates and you've seen very good examples of supply chains being interrupted with the Suez Canal this this week and then finally risk management which is ISO 31000 okay now all of these standards are statements of best practice so they're put together by experts um, from a wide variety of sectors and industries and they really essentially write down what best practice looks like but best practice only works if you do something so that's that's the the important bit to remember that the standard on its own is fine but in order to make something happen you have to do something and that's where the leadership team and the people part come in it's also supported by a series of other standards so this story this uh, webinar is not about uh, lists of standards but it shows you the sort of depth of understanding that supports what we're talking about so there's some really important ones in here uh, many of you will be familiar with BSI you know, so 9001 which is a quality management system um, 27001 information security management is very important business continuity is 22301 and I just want to sort of reference that because people say, well, what's the difference between business continuity and organizational resilience? Business continuity, we believe, is part of organizational resilience. Um, it's really important to be able to have playbooks in place to support uh, your organization through times of crisis. And interestingly, through this particular challenge, people were found not to have anticipated the, the black swan event of COVID-19 but organizational resilience is a, is a broader theme and business continuity is part of that and I'll, I'll illustrate that as we go through the framework um, so there's a whole load of st uh, standards there which help support so if you've got specific challenges there's almost certainly some sort of standard that supports it so I just want to make you aware of that so this is the framework itself and the framework comprises of four categories so leadership people process and product as i've mentioned earlier and it's made up of 16 elements so these are the elements that come from those particular standards so the first part leadership drives everything so the leadership part is really important um, we ask leaders how they how they think they're performing and we ask them on what their key challenges are and I'll, I'll describe those as we go through but the leadership function number one is really about the culture the vision and the drive to want to make change happen so very commonly and particularly in older more established businesses the leadership recognized that something's got to change but then the cost of changing is too great to make the change happen um, so it, part of the leadership function is the willingness to want to change to embrace the fact and commit to the fact that you that change is required so what sort of changes occur well the vision and purpose sets up the direction the business is going in and that's important for the, the team i.e the people around the business to understand what it is what is it that you're trying to drive towards because your clients will also need to understand that as well thirdly important from the, the leadership angle is the reputational risk and it's very easy to damage a brand particularly with social media and the speed of communications now 
by taking inappropriate actions, behaving unethically, or um, uh, sometimes misinforming people. So reputational risk is, is very important, needs to be looked at by the leadership or understood by the leadership. Fourthly, financial aspects. So obviously the stronger a balance sheet is, the more easy it is to be able to weather difficult storms. But it's also the flexibility of the balance sheet. Can finance be made available to make things happen? Because during change, we're going to need to probably move resources around. And that brings us to the fifth one, resource management. How flexible is that resource management? And where do you get your return on investment when things change? So being able to move the component parts of your business around, whether it's money, assets, people, and so on, that all impacts the ability to survive through difficult periods. So then we come to the three along the bottom. So the people part, the culture is really driven by leadership, but it involves the people. And there are many different sort of cultures that you can come across um, from very autocratic sort of type leadership through to very consensual and uh, collaborative sorts of arrangements. And we found that the role of people and process has been very important in the COVID period. So seven is community engagement, so just as community there, but it's it's the ecosystem within, within which your organization operates, both internally and externally. Who's involved with it? How do they, how does that, how are they impacted by whatever changes you make? Now, in order to get people to be flexible or to enable them to be flexible, we need to have awareness and training, and also their so looking at competencies. So you can obviously employ people in, but also we want to sort of organically grow our organizations as we move forwards. The ninth one is alignment. And there's a very good logo um, that a, a building company used to have with four or five people pulling on a rope. Now it's really important that the people in your organization hold the rope, which is essentially the direction you want to go in, and pull in the same direction. And that alignment is really important. So the larger the organization gets, the um, often you have silo type working. And it's really important when you're looking at change that the alignment takes place so that people pull in the same direction, that they understand where they're trying to go. The process part, governance, you can see there is the check against leadership in particular so we'll put that as a process so leadership doesn't um, operate in a completely unfettered manner it's sort of it has to be accountable and responsible for what it does as do the people within the business business continuity that's where that uh, uh, part lies in response to critical um, impact and then supply chain and we've seen this again as i said this week with Suez Canal, but the supply chain is really important and that's likely to get quite disrupted by um, something like COVID where you've got lockdowns and restrictions. So we wanted to investigate how do supply chains get affected as a result of COVID and we were expecting to get sort of shorter. Um, information and knowledge, very important. So again, information and knowledge handling, the, the way it's managed is also important to the resilience of a firm, and we've all heard where data leaks occur or where something is hacked, that um, it can impact the, the, um, the resilience of a firm. So we need to make sure that that's managed well and people understand how, to, how that's managed, the security issues. And finally, the, the last category product includes horizon scanning. So it's looking at what uh, is coming over the horizon and is within view that needs to be um, addressed. Either you can go around it or through it or just be aware of it. So horizon scanning is important because that um, sort of signals to consumers what it is that you're actually producing or providing as a service to them. And the final two, innovation and adaptive capacity. I'd like you to think of innovation as small steps, little incremental steps. Um, they do include the big changes, but Often it's continual improvement that is uh, really important to um, organizational resilience. And the adaptive capacity is the ability 
to flex these resources, the ability to stretch and morph depending on what's required through the context, either internally because of changes there or externally because of things that um, are coming on into the um, view on the horizon. So how does the framework work? Well, you should see it's got four shaded areas. We start with leadership on the top right, and uh, then we've got people, process, and product. And the, the each of the shaded areas contain those one of those 16 elements. So they're not equally spread, but we think that's the best sort of grouping for, for these elements. And we have a scale which runs from one to 10. Now you'll see on the graph that it starts at seven. So normally we abridge the scale because if you ask leaders, are you good at leadership? Most leaders will say, yes, I'm wonderful at leadership. Um, some even score themselves 10 on that. So we, we abridge that to, to show the relative movements that, that occur within each of the elements, but they're all important elements. Normally the graphs or charts consist of at least two lines. And what we're looking for is the gaps between the lines. So we're looking for the gaps, for example, where it's wide, where it's small, and also how the categories themselves behave. You know, can you see in the product or the people what changes have occurred. Now the elements work independently and they can also work as groups. So often when you have a reputational risk, for example, something gets damaged, you, the reputation gets damaged, it will have an effect in other areas. So it might have a financial effect in terms of shareholder price or share price. It may have effect in terms of governance and accountability, and it may have an effect in community engagement. Each narrative is unique to each firm, but you'll find that patterns occur where these elements connect together and you can see the patterns emerging. So let's have a look at, um, sorry, let's have a look at how we addressed uncertainty. So uncertainty makes leadership difficult. And obviously with a situation like COVID, everybody is suddenly aware that there's an uncertain world. In the early days, we weren't sure that a vaccine was going to be available. Now that to make uncertainty easier to manage, it's best to break it down into smaller chunks. And you'll find that uh, many organizations did this, but we did this very early. We looked at four key areas that we thought, or four key timescales that people would go through. Now, obviously, you can't predict what the time scale is, but you can recognize what the evidence is in each of these areas. So the first stage when lockdown came was to survive, literally to survive. Many businesses had their revenue streams cut off, cash flow severely implemented, uh, severely dented or stopped in some cases, and the firm has got to decide well, what to do. So firms would or leaders would have been looking for alternative sources of finance, whether it's loans, grants, they furloughed workers, and eventually you get through to a stabilized position. Okay, so not all firms will be able to transition through these phases, but those that do will go through these four phases and they may cycle back as, as you get more peaks um, and, and waves of coronavirus coming through. But it's really key to identify what stage you're in as an organization and countries and firms will transition through these stages at different rates. And that's the point of breaking it down into smaller chunks. If you imagine going across the desert and um, sand goes across any tracks or roads because of sandstorms, it's very difficult to navigate across the desert. So what they do is they put oil drums at mile intervals and you drive from one oil drum to the next, to the next, to the next. And this is really the process of making it more certain in an uncertain environment. So that was the reasoning behind this. So let's have a look at the report itself um, and what we actually found out from it. So the way the report's structured is there's um, a forward by our new chief executive, Susan Taylor Martin, which sort of outlines the general um, consensus around COVID, what, what's going on and how people are responding to this. And then we've got four 
chapters and the four chapters really relate to what we think is going to happen through this period. So the first one, chapter one, is adapting to sudden disruption. So this is the impact of COVID-19. In chapter two, we're looking at how leaders and people interact. So again, those are the two elements we talked about earlier. And it's very important that there's communication between those two elements and that people understand what it is that the, the organization is trying to do. And again, that's led by leadership. The third one is about um, innovation and adapt adaptation. So this is look, dealing with uncertainty. How do you ensure that you start to innovate? How do you ensure that your processes are working and your product moves forwards during this period? So we're looking towards that stabilize and rebuild phase. And then the fourth one, and I think this has been a real opportunity that's come out of COVID, is to look at sustainability. What are the trends? How is sustainability being put into or, or um, engineered into the way the organizations work? So that's supply chain, supply um, sustainability, looking at governance and responsibility for organizations. So when we looked at the, the overview of the um, index. This is what we actually did, so you understand the background behind it. We interviewed 515 senior leaders. Now that's really important because for this webinar and for the insights, we want peers to talk to peers so that you recognize, if you're a leader or senior um, executive in an organization, you recognize what the leaders are actually telling you. And we did an online survey, which is pretty detailed, so there's uh, quantitative and qualitative information in there. And what we're looking for is, how did they make those strategic directions um, and the decision-making around that? What did they do? What was going through their minds at those points? And I think because it's anonymous, there's been a lot of very good candid responses in there. And this time, we did it slightly different from before. Normally, we use a panel to sort of interview people. But this year, we used um, leaders that we knew. Um, so that lots of the leaders that we interviewed were connected to our leaders and our executive and our group executive. So that was really good because we felt we got a very good insight into what was going on for them. Very so what was really pleasing was that we got 41 in-depth interviews. Now, 41 in-depth interviews with senior leaders take some doing. And this is because of the relationship we have with, with um, these leaders. And they gave up their time to be able to talk to um, professional interviewers about the challenges that they faced. And I think that really backs up some of the findings that we found in this. We, are, we narrowed the countries down to five countries, so China, India, Japan, USA, and UK, and we looked at five sectors. Now that's slightly different from before. Normally we look at 10 countries and we look at 10 sectors, but this narrow focus gave us better insights, I believe. So we might expand that next year based on the way that we've approached it this year. So how does the index help leadership in particular? Well, it gives you a, a view on what the external and internal challenges are and the potential responses that people used. It can give you an insight into the sectors and countries perceived performance. Now, OK, if you've got five sectors, five countries and you've got 515 leaders, it's about 100. Um, the sample is about 100 per sector. So it's pretty good um, insights backed up with the qualitative information that helps us understand those sectors. But as I said, each, each narrative is slightly different. So we're looking for the decision making and we're looking for the challenges that they face. And then we saw some commonality there. It enables you to compare your own organization to the overall performance and the sector performance. So that's quite good. You can compare yourself with all the sectors and just your sector. And most importantly, it looks at the key leadership behaviors that were required to build resilience. So here are the key findings that we found out. Now, there are no big surprises here, but it's, it's the underlying story that's useful. So the first one 
is COVID-19 brought widespread disruption. Now, it's unique to have something that has such a big impact on the globe, rather than just a nation or just a sector, this is universally um, recognised as having an effect on the world. So collaborative agreements and um, consensus about how you move forward is really important. So the second point, we found that there was an increased emphasis on people and process. And I'll talk about that in the next slide, but that's quite different from where leadership thought it was in the previous three surveys. So that was quite a surprise and, I, and we can talk through the reasons behind that in a minute. The third one is it gave, gave the opportunity for the, to focus on the people and the planet. And there were many positive effects. So people noticed that birdsong sounded louder. Um, you notice that people were traveling less, so pollution um, dropped. Notice that people had a, because they were in lock, or many people were in lockdown, the move to remote learn, um, remote working had a big impact. And people suddenly realized, actually, we can do work differently and be as productive doing this. But there was a learning curve in order to make that happen. And not all jo jobs can be done, obviously, remotely. But it was recognized by all that a strong recovery required a flexible approach. And that was the ability to adapt and change and be able to ride through some of the difficulties. So some, some organizations structurally found this very difficult, particularly face-to-face -face and people facing ones like hospitality and travel and so on. Those found it difficult to go through this period. But there were other examples where engineering firms, even though they were in the supply chain to the aerospace industry, re, re, um, reuse their assets in order to make um, ventilators and they needed standards to be able to, to do that. But they, they showed that flexibility. Restaurants turned to takeaways. People like bridal gown manufacturers turned to making PPE, all in response to the, the pandemic. And the final point, and I think this is, this is a good one to end, end on on this five points, is there's cause for optimism. So when that vaccine arrived, the wave of optimism was palpable, and that's really important. And I think good leaders are optimistic, even when going gets really tough. So looking for ways to increase certainty is part of that cause for optimism. And that's why breaking things down into small chunks makes it um, slightly easier to handle. So this is one of the surprising things that we found. Now, remember I said that leadership um, normally sees themselves as high performing. If you ask a leader, are you good at performance? They'll say, yes, I'm great at leadership. It's a bit like asking a turkey, would you vote for Christmas? But in this instance, we found that leadership, whilst it was perceived as performing well, or they perceived themselves as performing well, the importance to organizational resilience dropped down to number one in the rank. So, but people rose from the middling position right to the top of the, the tree in 2020. So people were seen to be really important to how organizations got through that the pandemic or going through the pandemic. You can see also process improved as well. So whilst the performance dropped, and that's probably the learning part, the impact increased significantly. And similarly with product, and you can see that there's a rise in there. So these were interesting findings. And um, in the report, you can see how those broke down into the elements. But I think this nice simple chart gives you an idea of where, where people were moving, where they were focusing their attention. So leadership, whilst it's important, what's, and they drive what's happening, it's the people, the process, and the product that's having the big impact on whether you get through this, this period. So here's some interesting stuff. So when leaders talk, these are actual um, quotes from people who we interviewed. And all I've done is I've highlighted what they're saying in the colors relating to the categories. And you can see even in these paragraphs, there's some, there's some dense information there about 
what matters to leaders. So if you look at your own sort of commentary on how your organisations performed, and you just match it to is this a le is this about leadership? Is this about people, process, or product? You'll see that lots of the elements we're talking about, whilst people don't refer to them directly, they're in what's actually being talked about. So for example, how I was not expecting how well organized we were. That's about leadership and resource management. There was very little disruption. We know that's about the process part, what they were doing with adaptive capacity, being able to change. We had a lot of people sick. Okay, so that's obviously going to be people. They had to stay home. So some of those would have been working remotely. We had to hire a lot of people and do a lot of training. That's the pro that's the product part, but it's also people as well. So the training part is people. So you can see, have a look at your own statements that people have written about this. See if you can note whether it's leadership, people, process or product. There's very little that will be outside of that. I, I have done this for many years now, and I have found that these four categories cover everything that we're looking for if you look at the elements. If, the, if you find something that isn't in there, please tell me because I'd really like to know. Um, right, so here's what it looks like. Here's the, the radar diagram we've talked about and here are the three years, um, one after the other. So obviously they're different samples, but what we're looking for is, are there gaps? What, how big are those gaps? between the lines and are there points of interest that, that um, we should be noting or organisations should be noting. Now, as I said, I can't tell you the story behind these. I can make some assumptions, but the real story comes from the firm itself. So if I just highlight a few of these and you'll see what I mean. So first of all, product, you can see clearly there the red line, which is this or 2020's performance has jumped in adaptive capacity and innovation. So people have responded. They've done something differently from what they were normally doing in order to get through this period. Second one, the people part. You can see there that the awareness and training part has increased and also community engagement. So that's really important because there was, there was a feeling of we're all in this together. You know, as, as organizations, people stepped up to the plate and rather than just accept that's the way it is, a lot of effort was put into making the changes happen and that requires people. So you can see alignment, although it's lower, it's, start, it's higher than it was the, year, the previous year. So that again gives you sort of cause to, to investigate, to understand how your organization works. And the whole lot works holistically and as individual elements. So there'll be, co there'll be combinations of things going on there. And then the final one, you can see financial management. So again, we looked at the size of organizations and there's some very interesting information there about smaller firms finding it difficult because their cash flow gets affected very quickly with shorter order books, but also larger firms were less, um, perceived themselves as less organizational resilience, possibly because there's more stickiness in the firm in terms of being able to adapt and change. So again, you know, if, if you're a firm that's got a long history and um, it's difficult to change your product or you haven't thought about changing your product or service or delivery of the service, then that might cause problems for organizational resilience. So here's one on a sector. So I've just I've just taken this from these, these are actual figures, but I've made it agnostic. But it's just again to see how you use this graph. So there are only two lines on it. The red one is the performance for the whole set for all of the participants. And then the blue line is the performance for ABC. So ABC, when you look at this, the four categories, it looks as though it's doing pretty well in leadership, it's doing pretty well in people, pretty good in process, but not so good at product. So when you start to pull this apart, you can see horizon scanning is, is a problem for this particular sector. And that's largely caused by uncertainty but you have to ask the client what it is that they're finding is difficult. But innovation is not as high 
as it could be. And similarly, adaptive capacity, it's pretty close, but it's slightly below what everybody else is doing. Reputational risk is another area and also the awareness and training part. So you can see that this business has tried to align and tried to do the training part and is engaged with the community in order to make the changes happen. But then the final one, reputational risk, what's going on there? That would be a very interesting conversation to have with a business in that in that sector. Now, if you were a leader in that sector, you would know what the narrative was behind that. Right? So that's that's the purpose behind this. It gives you a holistic view that your team can assess where you think you are and then how you create a route map out of that. So how to use the framework? So there are global themes which come up regularly. So I've just picked out three because they came up quite frequently in, in all of the sectors. So horizon scanning. So what does that mean? Do we recognize the need for change in our sector and have we assessed the time scale and costs involved? So firms that fail to do horizon scanning can potentially feel that everything's okay but there's a waterfall looming. Reputational risk, what are the implications for longevity in the direction of the brand? Okay, very important to think about what's the product life cycle like of the, the brand that you're working with. And then adaptive capacity, what are the resource requirements to build or maintain resilience over time? So we're looking for that flexibility, the ability to make sure you've got the right resources to be applied to the right place to give you the return on investment. And I put another column in here because um, for those of you that lead businesses, you will undoubtedly experience this. And these are what I call the sleepless nights questions. Do we have the will to change? Remember leadership I said is one of the elements. It's that willingness and recognition that change is necessary. And I've worked with organizations that have recognized that the change is necessary, but have not had the response to it. All right, they've, they've not recognized, well, what do we do? And that requires innovation and a different way of thinking. So sometimes the thought process and the behaviors that you need to do when you're in a sticky situation is to do things that are slightly counterintuitive. So instead of maybe controlling and um, being consistent in the organization, the way that you work, it might require to be flexible and adaptable and think differently about the same product. And in fact, that's essentially what disruptors to industries do. They look at, look at a sector and say, can we do this differently? Is there another way of doing this? And that can significantly disrupt quite long-term um, organizations that have had very successful periods. So you can see in the, the high street, there's massive change going on at the moment. So we can see that internet shopping has increased. We can see that footfalls fallen. So what does that mean to the high street? I don't think the high street's dead, but they do have to reinvent themselves. And then what's the current trajectory of the brand? You know, that's averages don't lie. It's sort of what's the trend doing? So how do we reverse a trend or how do we improve a trend? And what is the most effective and efficient way to make change happen? So obviously that's using your team to think about these problems. And the key question, what are the costs of not changing? If you don't change, what's going to happen? And you can see firms that fail have not thought about what they could do differently and how to do it. So let's have a look at how this, this all fits together. So resilience starts with leadership. So I've put around the leadership element, all of the elements that we've talked about. They are, the leadership is aware of global themes. So it could be sustainability, innovation, internet of things, all sorts of things that are universally out there as global things. And the leadership has to decide which of these are relevant to their organization in terms of a commercial sense? The next bit is people. So let's put those in around there. So reputational risk, 
community engagement and culture sort of fit together quite nicely. And again, you can see it sort of fits around the people element. The process element fits around the people element. So we've got governance and accountability, business continuity, information and knowledge management. So wherever there's a touch point on these hexagons, there's some sort of involvement. Now, some of these may have touch points that occur elsewhere, but this is just a visual representation to help you understand how we put these ideas together. And then the product sits around that as well. So information knowledge management, very linked to horizon scanning, process linked to innovation, supply chain process and innovation are linked to adaptive capacity. And then on top of that, we can put the things that BSI does to help leaders do this. So we're interested in sustainability is a big theme. We produce this index report to help leaders understand what their sector's doing. We're extremely keen on organizational resilience. What makes your vision turn into something that's going to enable you to be here for the long term, not the short term? We'll, we'll do that as well, but it's the, it's the long term vision for your organization. And we think that the framework tool that I'm just talking about helps teams do that. It opens up a holistic discussion within your team. Very often, and it's, I would say it's more often than not, talk to leadership teams and work with the leadership teams and they have quite a siloed approach to how that team works together and yet if you think about about it it's the organization as the whole they're trying to protect so you can have a fantastic functional department but if it's not working in harmony with the other departments you won't get to organizational resilience you'll just get a very good department On the right hand side, we've got all the things that BSI does to support product, process, people and leadership. So the black hexagons are the things that we do. So standards are at the, at the heart of what we actually go about producing. We help businesses develop passes. We create certification based on assurance. Quality is really important to, to customers they want to know they're getting the right thing the right service so we look for those standards to help people do that and we develop standards to make that happen and there's also an online service which enables you to access this information and then finally we just put in the things we do training to support all the people part and the health and safety and well-being element which is really becoming increasingly important you've seen how significant mental health is and physical health during periods of lockdown, that will become a very big issue over the next several years, I'm sure, as a result of this. And then we have a consulting team who, with the dotted line, is able to help leadership teams. Obviously, there's a conflict of interest in there. That's why there's a dotted line. And we also have information security to help manage the security of your information and knowledge. So let's have a look at solving cha um, challenges in your organization. How does it actually work? And why is this conversation relevant to you? Well, at the top of the organization is the head, the leadership part. They do the thinking for the organization. They work out the direction the business is going, that forward view of what's going on. But all those forward views are, are based against what happens internally. And the senior managers, the heart of the business, have to make decisions and investigate what's going on. So if there's a global theme, it's normally aligned to the vision and purpose of the organization. The senior managers are asked to explore the business case and associated risks involved with that. They might also sort of create their own opportunities because they see things close to what's going on with clients or maybe at the coal face where things happen at the sharp end and they report back to the leadership to inform them about the direction the business should go in and obviously the leaders can make their own mind up as well about the direction of the business and that gets fed back and then eventually it becomes executed by the operational level so each of these areas has or each of these levels within an organization whilst they're talking about the same theme have different needs so the operational level, they want minimum pain 
make this easy for me? Can I put this into practice? Why do I have to change is the common thing. We've always done it this way. Senior managers want to know, is there a business case? What are the risks involved in doing that? So we're starting to get more to the numbers element and obviously the, the interaction with people part. And then the leadership bit wants to know that that is aligned with the big themes that the organization wants to do. Is it ethical? Is it, is it sort of the approach that we should be using? Because that affects the reputational risk of the business as well. When that goes wrong, you get organizational resilience problems. So here's how BSI used it in practice. I did this with the executive team back in 2018, in the early days of us looking at this. And you notice the scale is different, so it's one to six, but we changed that for various reasons. Leadership, people, process and product, you can see around there. Now, this is interesting. The group exec, who are a small number, um, probably eight or nine, saw themselves more positively or perceived their performance more positively than the non-group exec. And you can see where the pinch points are. The pinch point is where innovation and adaptive capacity are. So a decision was made. Now, again, they would understand the narrative, narrative behind this and it's the leadership team that makes the decisions. And it was realized that we did need to adapt and innovate in order to be successful going forwards. And you can see horizon scanning is actually pretty good here. And you'd expect that in a standards organization because they've got to scan the horizon to decide what standards are appropriate and relevant to clients coming down the track. So innovation and adaptive capacity, what happened? Well, the exec decided to appoint a director of technology, sorry, director of innovation. And um, as a result of that person joining the firm or being appointed into the firm, we created immersive technology. And that enabled us to do remote, uh, remote auditing using drones, smart glasses on, on clients and so on. And by 2020, we honed this to get shortlisted for responsible business awards by Reuters. And that's, that's a real example of where this has this has revealed where the the area of focus needs to be and then the business did something about it and when i've worked with organizations or they've used this technique they have also found there are areas that they need to address and sometimes those are really difficult problems but it just gives the team a holistic view of where they're trying to go and what to do and where the focus needs to be and that's why it's such a valuable tool um, when I was turning firms around uh, many moons ago, I wish I'd had this tool available because it would it puts a good scope around what you need to focus on rather than intuitively gauging where the spinning plates might be falling off the sticks. So finally, what do you take away from this? Well, what we'd really like you to do is to download and review the OR index report, have a look at it, see if your sector's in there. If your sector isn't in there, what can you learn from other sectors? Sort of have a, an open mind to sort of seeing what the challenges were, because despite the sectors, you'll find that the challenges are similar across other sectors and you'll spot differences and they make, you'll be able to make connections between them. Check your own OR perception using the ben benchmark tool on the BSI website. It is totally free. It'll only give you one result, but if you want to do it, if you want to find out more, you could get your team to do it and put this together on an Excel spreadsheet. If you want to get involved with us, please reach out. We will do this for free for you. And you can look at 150 people within your organization. We will create the spider diagrams in the sector and give you as much insight as we can to enable you to make decisions. We want you to be able to create a route map to build or strengthen organizational resilience. That's what BSI exists for. We are there to help clients do this. If you want further advice or specific advice on particular areas, please talk to us. Obviously, when we're not experts in some areas, for example, financial management, you have experts to do that. But in many areas, 
we've got experts who can deal with all of these things. And that holistic approach, bringing people together can really be beneficial to you. So that's the, the end of the webinar. If there are any questions, I'm delighted to, to try and answer those. And let me just um, go down to that. I'll pull the questions up. Oops, there we go. Questions. Did I miss a bit What for the two lines? Ah, right, okay, yes, that's a good question. The two lines could be sectors, they could be firms, they could be a mean, they could be a firm and so on. So we always try to put two lines on. So that's that's a very good question. The two lines will be depending on what you're looking for. So sometimes I put the median on and the median is useful. So sometimes you'll see three lines. The median's useful because it tells you how much of a skew there is within each of the um, responses from the either the sectors or the, the whole result. So if we've got a, a median and it's out outside of the um, outside of one of the lines you're looking at, it tells you that somewhere somebody is scoring very highly. Okay, now I don't know the answer to why they're scoring very highly, and they may be may be over optimistic or whatever, but um, or <laughs> are deluded sometimes. So you know, if people are scoring tens around this for all angles, then it's very unlikely they're really appreciating the significance of these these elements. It's not it's not sort of like um, a competition to get as high as possible. It's trying to have a, a a good and realistic view of where you think you are. Okay, so when you ask your own people, they will tend to have a slightly more pessimistic view of this when compared to when you do it publicly. And that's useful because gaps will appear. They will almost certainly appear, particularly between different levels within organization, maybe between different functions, maybe between different countries. But that insight is really useful as a leader because it enables you to have that conversation, which, which um, sadly doesn't occur as often as people think it might. So that's why the tool is useful to leadership teams. Are there any other questions? So that was Christian. Thank you for asking that, Christian. Any other questions? If, if you want to reach out privately, then please do so. Uh, my address is quentin.dunstan at bsigroup.com. BSI is very easy to contact. There's loads of information on organizational resilience and the things that we do. Um, also interesting, you might find that the BSI Cranfield work is good for leadership behaviours. Again, report, just download it, and you'll see the different sorts of behaviours that I've been talking about as we go through this. But thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you found that valuable, and uh, good luck and stay safe. <laughs>